Yeah, thank you so much to Ki Jung and uh, Hanbi and Sue for that lovely song. Thank you too, Mabel and Pianist for the... You know, we've sung a lot of theology this morning. Yeah? And what should theology lead to? Doxology. That's the direction. And that verse was very interesting that that uh, Jalou brought from Romans. It said, how unsearchable are his judgments. Did you notice? How unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable are his ways. I want to uh, just put a picture up on the screen first. Please, John. Yeah? Is it up? It's up. Yeah? It looks like a double rainbow, doesn't it? And it's getting reflection in the sea below. I want to talk about one of the biggest judgments. Not the biggest judgment, but one of the biggest judgments that God has ever made. And I guess you know where I'll be speaking from if you look at a rainbow. Can I just point out, though, that if you were to count those colours, you know, of course, how many colours there are in the rainbow, don't you? Richard of York gained battles in vain. That's what I learned. Do you remember the seven colours of the rainbow? You see, these days, there's another rainbow. Forgive me for a slight diversion. There's another popular rainbow. It's almost taken political prominence as well. But do you know that that rainbow, promoted primarily, of course, by the LGBTQ+, plus, whatever, that rainbow only has six colours. <laughs> you all knew that, of course, didn't you? Six colours. It's an imperfect rainbow. That's the perfect rainbow because it's God's sign. It's a rainbow given by God. And it, to me, it displays his perfection. The current political rainbow, I think, displays imperfection as far as God is concerned. I want to give you a reading now, uh, which is going to come up on the screen. I'm going to be speaking, of course, from the man who, first man who witnessed that rainbow, Noah. Yeah, and this is the reading that we're going to have. It actually picks up from chapter 5 and the last verse of chapter 5. This is taking us right back into Genesis. Now, you might think that Genesis and a lot of Genesis is myth. Or you might think it's allegorical rather than historical. But I want to just remind you, in case you're not aware that not only did Jesus refer to Noah, but so did the Apostle Peter refer to Noah. So did Jude, the penultimate book in the New Testament before Revelation. They all referred to Noah and the events that took place. So I, for one, believe that it was an historical event. It was part of the salvation plan and progress of God. You see, a lot of people also think that grace, that wonderful word grace, <laughs> yeah, great riches at Christ's expense, <laughs> somebody used that as a, as, a, as a what you call it? An acrostic. <laughs> yeah. That grace, you know, only appeared on the scene in the New Testament. Grace is woven into the scriptures and into God's purposes right from the beginning. Even in this of God's judgments, grace is displayed. I believe the Bible teaches that God just doesn't exercise his judgment without mercy and without grace. But God will judge. And there's another judgment coming in the future. We'll all be subject to a judgment. Now, we don't like that. You know, my, my natural heart... 
resist that. You know, why does God allow this? Why does God not do this? Why, you know, why is he absent? That's the kind of heart that doesn't even understand God. And my heart and my understanding have to come into submission to God. Why? Because he's God. And for no other reason. You know, one prophet said, or gave an illustration, about the moulding of a piece of pottery. You know how we like to see these programs where people make pottery, put a lump of clay on the wheel? You know? And it was an illustration where the clay doesn't tell the potter what to do. It's the potter that determines what he'll make out of the clay. That's an illustration of God's authority over you and I, over all the earth. I'm flitting about here a little bit. I know for you who are going to get constrained, Eddie, come to the point. But I'm diverting in. I noticed that on the coffin of Queen Elizabeth, on that catafalque, was the globe and was the scepter. One commentator, the first commentator in Westminster Hall, made a reference to that globe. It's a ball, looks like, you know, a golden ball. And there's a cross on the top of the ball. And the commentator actually said the words, that is a representation of Christ's authority over all the earth. I thought, wow, can you repeat that again? <laughs> you know? That is an illustration. That's meant to depict Christ's dominion over all the earth. Oh, somebody's here this morning. That's the point. That's the point. This is the place to come. This is the place to be. Praise God we can worship him all the time, everywhere, anywhere, 24-7. But isn't it good when the church comes together and acknowledge who Jesus Christ is? I need my view of God to grow. Amen. Can I tell you, folks, I'll be very bold. Your view of God needs to increase. The problem is, after time, our view of God is too our God is too small, and I'm too big. We need to flip it over. The preacher in Ecclesiastes said, "Be careful when you come to the house of the Lord. Guard your mouth, because God is in heaven and you're on earth." I've begun to appreciate cathedrals a lot more these days. I did have once have a, an ambition on my bucket list. It wasn't to join the NASA space program that I heard about last week. It was to visit all the cathedrals in the UK. Well, of course, I'm not doing it. But you know, there's one thing about them. They make you look up. Perhaps that was the design of a lot of these architects. When you go in, you're not looking at the bits and pieces down here. You're thinking, wow. Okay, we might just admire the structure. But I think it's meant to get us to elevate, elevate our eyes and look up. Christ has dominion over all the earth. And grace, his grace, is written into all his judgments. So let's get to this incredible reading. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. There used to be a joke in youth church, in this church many years ago, that when Noah's sons were talked about, the young kids would say, yeah, Shem, Ham, and Beef. <laughs> you know, a little bit of humour. I don't think he was too irreverent. He fathered these three sons. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. If you read in the preceding chapters, some of these people were alive for a long time. Like Methuselah, you know, you Bible students, you know, he was 969 years old when he died. 
for his flesh, uh, for his flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. They, these were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown or giants, big people. You know, you've got to remain a Christian for a long time to get into some of this stuff. There isn't time to go into that now, but I have a view on what was all taking place here. And so do many Bible students and scholars and theologians. They saw, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he grieved or he pained him in his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry, I regret that I have made them. You know, I can hear the unbelieving heart in my ears, the unregenerate heart contesting with God. How can he do such a thing? How can God blot out the whole of the human race? That's not very loving of God, is it? When you become a Christian, you get to grips with God because God wants to get to grips with you. And I praise God for the way he's got to grips with me. And it's getting better as time goes on. Keep coming to prayer meetings. Keep coming to Bible studies, folks. If you really want to be a Christian, <laughs> you need to grow. I'm sorry that I have made them. This is one of the wonderful buts of Scripture. We used to have a woman in this church who loved the buts of Scripture. She was a spinster, <laughs> medical person. But, but what? But is a little three-letter word, isn't it? I think it's called, grammatically, a conjunction. It kind of joins two things together. But it makes a contrast of something that went before but and something that comes after but. You know? You're all looking wonderful this morning, but for Eddie Williams, who looks a bit of a scruff. You know? But it's making a contrast. It's comparing the alternatives. And this is what this is doing here. But Noah found grace or favour in the eyes of the Lord. I told you grace was there at the beginning, even before this verse. God has only ever worked in grace along with judgment and mercy. They're not things that God attributes that God forgets about sometimes. He forgets his grace because he's pronouncing judgment or carrying out the execution of his will. But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt. You see, we have to listen to the description of this. I hope you don't think it's boring. <laughs> this, is, this is the scripture. This is an account of the way the earth was, the way humanity was. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence and God saw and God and God saw the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth and God said to Noah I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence did you notice anything when you read those scriptures? Sometimes in Bible readings, it's good to notice the obvious. The times that the word corrupt occurred, or violent, or corrupted, several times in those few verses, this is a description of society, of humanity, in its day. Can I just remind you that what Jesus said about this period of time Jesus said, 
that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. You know, we are fools if we don't understand what is happening in the world today. I mean, as Christians, Christians, you know, I think somebody has said it, we need the Bible in one hand and then newspaper in the other way. You don't hold a newspaper these days, but you know, the news. Surely it's no surprise that a lot of the things and the scene of society that we see in these days. Jesus said it would be as it was in the days of Noah. Lots of other things going on as well. Jesus said, yes, they'd be marrying, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, almost as though life is just going on as normal, and it does. You know, we're not killing each other every five minutes, although it's hard sometimes to discount that. Life is going on as normal because people are going to be unaware about the coming again of the Son of Man. <laughs> Jesus is coming again. The one who has dominion over all the... Well, he has dominion over the cosmos. I don't know whether that globe, that royal globe was meant to portray just the earth or the cosmos. But Jesus is Lord of all... And God would have all men and women to repent and to come to a knowledge of the truth because that's God's good design. God doesn't dispense with his grace and his mercy and his loving kindness when he's exercising judgment. Can I tell you what the greatest judgment that I think has ever taken place? In a way, this pales into insignificance what we've been reading about the time of Noah, the greatest judgment that has ever happened is speaking to us there. The judgment that took place on Calvary. <laughs> you spelled out Cal uh, love to us, Pastor Jello. <laughs> love on Calvary. Isn't it wonderful that God loved us so much? But God judged his son. He poured out his wrath upon his son. Jesus took the wrath of God that's due to the whole human race, to every single one of us here this morning. That may offend your ears, but we deserve the judgment of God. We, like the people in Noah's day, are corrupt our thinking is corrupt in what sense? It means in the sense that we don't have a true knowledge of God. Our hearts are evil. We inherited that from the first man and woman who fell from God's grace. And that has come down through the human race. And Genesis and these verses, these passages that I've been looking at here, really show us and illustrate, us, illustrate that to us. Our hearts are evil. In fact, I was reminded the last time I read the account of Peter speaking on the day of Pentecost. You know, we make such a lot about what happened on Pentecost. Do you know what was said on Pentecost? Peter said to the people who got convicted because they'd decided to crucify this man. We'll have Barabbas, not Jesus of Nazareth, crucify him, crucify him. And they suddenly felt guilty about it. And what did Peter, the apostle, say to them? He said, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. It's a generation, it's a world that has rejected God. The world gets on without God, so it thinks. Life goes on. <laughs> It's great, isn't it, to eat and drink? And the scriptures tell us to enjoy those things. Enjoy your work. Get satisfaction out of constructing things and doing things. 
enjoy your relationships as husband and wife, you know, find a wife, settle down, enjoy life, sure. But life is meaningless without God. If God is absent, life is empty. I feel like I'm saying a lot of offensive things this morning. <laughs> it's what I've come to believe and, and been convicted about from God's word. I spent a few months reading through Ecclesiastes. <sighs> By dumb. <laughs> if any of you know Ecclesiastes, perhaps you can sympathise. You know, it's not easy going. But it's, all, it's a view on what life is, ordinary life going on under the sun. But without God, without God in the picture, what's the point? What's the point? It's like going to a funeral where God is absent, the maker of all the earth. In him we live and move and have our being. He gives life. Welcome to Theodore this morning. The new life has come into the church. Yeah? Little Theodore Pittler Tenenberg. God has made that happen. God has made that to be the case. And yet, we don't need him. And we fill our lives with all sorts of other things, first and foremost. And God doesn't say, don't fill your lives with other things. There are lots of things to enjoy. Yeah? Life can be very depressing and discouraging at times, can't it? My wife gets fed up with watching the news and I want to watch the news, but it's all, you know, it's depressing news, isn't it? Yeah? <laughs> Enjoy life, but don't leave God out of the picture. Jesus said, I've come that your life may be full, abundant. The giver of life wants us to enjoy life. Wants a full life, a fulfilling life. Life before death and life after death as well. Amen. Well, he went on and said, Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself. And so several times now the word make or construct appears. God gives a plan to Noah. How about that? Noah didn't decide how to build the ark. Some think that it wasn't much of a, a floating vessel. Well, I want to tell you folks, it wasn't meant to be a naval destroyer. It wasn't meant to be a cruise ship. It wasn't even meant to be an ocean-going vessel. There was nothing sophisticated about this vessel called the ark. 150 metres long, about 25 metres wide, and about 15 metres tall. As long as it floated, and as long as it kept what was inside it secure and safe, that's what was important. And God gave him the construction plan. It came from God. And that's to me, is the biggest illustration about the building of this ark. It talks about God's plans. God has a plan for you and I. God has a plan for this world and he's executing his plan for this world. So he tells him to make an ark. He did things God's way. He did things God's way. He listened to God. He heard what God had to say and he made the decision <laughs> to follow God's way. And grace found Noah. Isn't that wonderful? God's undeserved favour. You see, Noah came the same way as everybody else did at that time in Genesis. Through the way of the fall, through the line of sin and disobedience, the Bible says, all have sinned. Does that offend you this morning? I'm not out to offend, folks, but it's important to know the truth. And the truth is <laughs> that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? I don't think we know exactly what we're like until we come to faith in Christ. 
until we're before God and allow God to search us. Then one of the next to one of the Psalms that was read this morning in our trilogy of Psalms, did you notice that? Is you have searched me, O God, and you know me. Are you prepared to let God search you? To come into his all seeing gaze? To come under his judgment? To come into the light of God? That's the beginning of conversion. That's the beginning of coming into a relationship with God. Because we find God's grace and mercy when we're in his presence. Presence, not judgment, but mercy. And the mercy's been shown <laughs> in Jesus Christ. Perhaps I'm not getting the balance perfectly right here this morning. Forgive me for that. But I'm trying to show that God does judge and he has to judge because of his nature. Do you know, you know, somebody said he didn't know. I keep repeating this probably every time I preach. Somebody said, you know, um, if God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologise to Sodom and Gomorrah. If we say, why doesn't God do something? I'd come back with another question. What do you want him to do? What would you like him to do? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? We need to come to a place where we know that God is God and God is right. It's me that has to conform to his ways, to him. The problem is that we want to conform God to our thinking, to our understanding, to our intelligence, to our intellect, to our psychology. Give up trying to make God into your image and submit to him making you in his image. God had made man in his own image. And sometime later, seven generations actually, seven generations later, God had to make a regrettable decision. It says that God repented, God regretted that he had to destroy all that he created because of the corruption, because of the evil. Folks, I have no doubt that that evil is in the world today. You know, for heaven's sake, for, forgive me, it, it's like almost a natural reaction. Have we got eyes that are closed? Sure, we can turn away. <laughs> you know, we can, we can blot it out. We can, we can watch something else that's more pleasant and more happy. Of course we can. And God would have us enjoy life. But don't be blind to the evil and the corruption that is there in the heart of men and women. And I know one famous past preacher who said about himself, Lloyd, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones no less, that he knew that within his own heart was the potential for the most heinous of evils. We think we're different. We think, I think I'm not like so-and-so. Really? Sometimes situations develop where I see what my heart is like. I need God to save me. <laughs> I need God to go on saving me. Yeah? We talk about go on being filled with the Spirit. Yeah, that's going on being saved, being changed, being conformed to the image of Christ. And that's a lifelong work. Becoming a Christian, becoming a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ is not just a five minute <laughs> press the button, that's it, okay. No way. <laughs> You'll learn more about yourself as life goes on. So the ark was constructed. What can we what can I say about this ark? Well, in many ways, you know, for your Bible student, it prefigures something of Christ himself. It was a divine provision. Noah didn't come up with the idea. Noah didn't decide to build one, what his dimensions should be. It was a provision of God to save him and his family. 
And it was a divine invitation to come in. Come in with your family, your wife, your sons, three sons and their wives. Come in. God made the provision. He made, gave, uh, gave um, Noah the plans. Looking through the lens of the New Testament, God has done that for you and I in this day and age. God has provided his son as a means of salvation to save us, to change us, to give us a new life now, to put his spirit within us, to help us to walk in his ways and to become more like Christ. God has said, come on in, come unto me. And by the way, the name Noah, the name Noah means comfort or rest. Comfort or rest. Why? Why was he given that name by his uh, father, Lamech? Well, because they knew that God, had, in his judgment, had cursed the earth with the fall of Adam and Eve. And Lamech said, his father, Noah's father said, he'll bring us comfort, he'll bring us rest. Jesus has come to give you rest. He's come to bring you comfort. Do you not need any comfort? Are you okay as you are? Yeah, is your bank balance okay? Got all you need? You know, <laughs> we need. <laughs> Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labour and are heavy laden, burdened, burdened. Are you satisfied with your life? If you are, well, carry on. It's not until we come to a place where we realise that in ourselves we're not sufficient. We need the residing presence of God living within us. And so Jesus comes and says, come to me. He's been sent by God. God sent his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, should not perish. How many died? The whole human race should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The world was saved. Have we missed that? In the judgment and all the awful perishing of these lives, the world was saved, saved through one man and one family. <laughs> There's no other salvation for us but in Jesus Christ. Sorry to be so pointed, but he is the way, the only way, the truth and the life. So the ark is like an invitation that we get in Jesus Christ. I urge you, save yourself. Save yourself. Don't wait and sit around. I recently had a bit of a family conference over breakfast. It wasn't a conference. But I was asking somebody in the wider family that I'm part of, because uh, she's come into our family as, uh, as uh, um, what, what is she? Well, she, she, she's my step, rel step relative. And, and I know that she has other members of the family who are believers. And we were talking about them. I said, well, how are they? How have they come to faith in Christ? She said, well, they had a calling from God. I haven't had one, she said. She said, like you, you've had a calling. I haven't, she said. You know, it's a strange thing. It's almost as though, well, okay, I'll just sit back and wait for God to save me. God has provided the means of salvation. You have nothing to do but to receive what God has given in Christ. Noah, build the ark. This is my plan. This is my provision. It'll save you. You'll be secure. You won't perish. Boy, how we trusted God. We need to trust God today and believe 
on the Lord Jesus Christ. He was obedient. Faith is obedience. The Apostle Paul in Romans talked about he'd come to give a message of the obedience of faith, to bring the Gentiles, to bring us lot outside the Jews, Jewish nation, to bring us to the obedience of Christ, ruler of all the earth. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. Is he your Lord today? Have you received Jesus Christ? To as many as received him, said John the Apostle, to them gave you the authority to become the children of God. To those who believed on his name. It's a narrow way. It's a narrow way, but it's the only way. Is this the only way, Noah, that you, you know, a flimsy boat like this? How on earth? It looked ridiculous as well, probably, to the people of, of his time. They'd never seen rain before. At least we think they hadn't seen rain before. That seems to be the account. What are you building this boat for? Oh, because God's told me to. Why do you believe? Why are you a Christian? Because God has called me to be. He's done the choosing. He's done the providing. I've just done the receiving. <laughs> Happy is the man whose sins are forgiven. God has done all that's necessary to preserve us and to save us and to give us a secure and eternal future beyond this life and forever. So it was God's plan, not Noah's. It was God's plan of salvation. Noah was obedient. And today, in the same way, I think I'm preaching the same grace. Come unto me, said Jesus. Are you going to come? Or are you going to wait? Oh, well, it'll happen when it happens. I'll wait for God to do something. God draws near. God comes. He comes with this message of grace. None of us deserve that grace. We deserve judgment. Judgment for our sin. Judgment for the corruption of our nature. But God has dealt with that. On Jesus was placed all our guilt, all our shame, all our sins, all our undoing. All of it was placed upon him and God judged my sin in Jesus. It's as simple and straightforward as that to me. And it's worked. It's worked. Just like the ark worked. Do you think Noah might have been, and his wife and the kids, might have been in that ark, in that boat, really wondering, oh, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Do you know there's only one door to the ark? <laughs> one door on the side. <laughs> and the text tells us later on, haven't read it all, I know. Um, it says in verse 16 of that section, and those that entered male and female, the male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded him and the Lord shut him in. Other people here this morning who have been shut in with God. You know, Paul the Apostle talked about the life of the believer is hidden with Christ in God. You know, this isn't, this isn't human nature boasting. I remember being accused once, not long after becoming a Christian, by a guy who I admired in my, my drinking and my football circle at work. He accused me of a sin of presumption. How can you know that you're saved? Well, he came from a religious background that really couldn't claim that. I'm only claiming it by the grace of God. To as many as received him, received Jesus Christ, to them God gives the authority to become the children of God. 
And through Noah, the human race was preserved. God's grace, that line of grace and salvation, purposes of God, carried on. And on and on it went. I finished. I finished. And the Lord shut the door. Jesus said, I'm the door. By me, if any man or woman enters in, they shall be saved. Do you want to be saved? Do you know you need to be saved? Are you unsure? Today. Maybe it's a day when you can get that sense of being shut in because you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And although, although the floods are going to continue, the flood in the human race, things are not going to get better. Sorry, folks, I'm here again, aren't I? More bad news. Listen, the good news of the gospel is wonderful. But you know, it also claims a warning. It proclaims a warning. The gospel is a warning. There is judgment to come. I'm glad of warnings, aren't you, motorists? You know, when we approach certain junctions, there's a warning sign. It's there for a good reason. If we ignore it and carry out, there may be a, a mighty collision. Could even be killed. So warnings are good. As Peter the Apostle said, save yourselves. What shall we do? What shall we do? We've made this enormous mistake. We've crucified the Lord of glory. What shall we do? Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. By repentance. <laughs> By changing the outlook. And coming to God. And asking him to take you on. To shut you in. Hey, this church is here to give this message. <laughs> That's our raison d'etre. That's why we're here. Not to have just a good time, but to show the way. We're bringing the good news, hopefully, to a community and to any who come into this church. But come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And youngsters, teenagers. <laughs> I'm noted that Noah... God said, come into the ark, you and your family. I'm struck in the New Testament the number of times that people are told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and your household. You should be saved and your household. Families keep coming. Teenagers, God has a purpose for you. He has an abundant life for you if you follow Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you. Amen. Let me just close with a prayer and then I'll hand over to Pastor Jillo. Heavenly Father, the, the wisdom of your word makes wise the simple. Grant to us, I pray, that childlike attitude, a childlike attitude that will trust you, believe in your word and in the message of your grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, I pray this day. Amen.